Hello, Kansas City, and welcome to another episode of Speak Up, brought to you live stream from the best live streaming channel that you can get on, which is Televita. If you don't know about Televita, hit us up on YouTube and Facebook. Today, I am super duper excited. I can <laughs> run around the room, turn flips. This is a awesome day. So as you can see, I am sitting in one of the national historic museums in the world. This is the Negro League Baseball Museum. And, you know, we could talk a lot about what goes on in our community and who we are, but you cannot talk about anything unless you're talking about this museum and what it means to our community. Now, we know that Buck O'Neill is our favorite guy. <laughs> There's a legacy that he has given our community and all his work, but I'm a legend who keeps his legacy alive. And I'm excited to have Bob Kendrick, the one that keeps Buck's name in everybody's mouth. He is the president of the Negro Baseball Museum, and we are going to just sit down and kick it today. Bob, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And let's speak up. Let's talk about the community. Let's talk about the museum. So I'm going to let you start off by telling us, what's up? <laughs> well, Kim, first and foremost, Thank you for having me on Speak Up. It's a pleasure. You know, it's always a welcome sight to see you Aww. here at the museum. And uh, you've been a frequent visitor and a supporter of this organization. And so I really do appreciate this opportunity. Anytime I get to talk about the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, it is a welcomed opportunity. Yes. But to sit down and talk to you, the organization that you so beautifully represent, it makes it even more meaningful. Because I think back to when the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum was in a little tiny one room office wow, yes. across the street inside the historic Lincoln Building. Wow. Now the museum established itself in 1990 in that little one room office. And I get introduced to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in 1993. And I'm working for the Kansas City Star at that time. I had drawn the assignment of promoting the museum's first ever traveling exhibition, an exhibition called Discover Greatness. It is still touring the country to this day, 29 wow. years later. And so the Star, I was working in the promotions department. We would provide print space for not-for-profit organizations to promote special events and other activities that they had on a pro bono basis. And so I come down to see this Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, which I did not know even existed at the time, <laughs> so that I could get a little background information to help put together this campaign. So I go to the Lincoln Building, and I'm searching. Right. I go up to the third floor, and I knock on the door. The late Don Motley, who was the executive director of the museum at that time, is seated behind the desk. I knock on the door, and I say, I'm looking for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. <laughs> and he looks at me, Kim, and he says, son, you're standing <laughs> in it. And little did I know that I had literally just walked into what would become my passion. Wow. I fell in love with the museum, what it represented, the story that it was telling. I fell in love with the amazing athletes who made this yeah. story. Yeah. And then I started to meet them. And as you wow. know, one yes. particular yes. athlete, yes. Yes. our friend, the late, great Buck O'Neill. Absolutely. And I was no different than anybody who met Buck. Yeah. It oh. was love at first sight. Yes. Yeah, it was love at first sight. And yeah. as I've oftentimes said, once you're bitten by the Buck bug, it's a wrap. Oh. Absolutely. I really think Buck has like has uh, reincarnated in your spirit <laughs> because honestly, it's the same with you. Yeah. Uh, when people meet you, the name Bob Kendrick across the, you know, at first it was Kansas City, but you can go anywhere in the country now and say Negro Baseball Museum and they'll say Bob Kendrick. Or you'll say Bob Kendrick and they'll say uh, Negro Baseball yeah. Museum in Kansas City. So, you know, you talk about how you fell in love and how mm -hmm. this, this would become your passion. Yeah. Bas basically, you stepped into your destiny. I it, did. You stepped into your destiny. So, you know, um, the show talks about the ecosystem and the revitalization mm -hmm. and the rebuilding of our community. You, know, you and I go back and we know how it was. So we have the yesteryear, yeah. but we also have to look at the future. Tell me what we are doing today 
for the revitalization to, you know, to retain the history, but to move it into our next generation? And, and that's a great question, because when we go back and look at the history of this organization, Kim, this was never a self-serving proposition. Mm -hmm. So when we made the decision to anchor here at Historic 18th and Vine in 1990, when the museum was established, there was nothing else here at Historic yeah. 18th and Vine yeah. except the Lincoln Building. Yes, it was really the only functioning business yeah. or building in this once very proud, prominent community. Yes, And so as you can well imagine, there were many who are supporters of this museum today mm -hmm. who was not necessarily feeling the fact <laughs> that we were going to anchor here. And, and you know what? I can understand why. Yeah. Because there was no built-in foot traffic. Yes. So their question to us was, who's going to come see you? And, and, and that was a legitimate question. Yes. There were better business opportunities for this museum to locate in a place that had that infrastructure built in already if we were just simply looking at it from a business perspective. Correct. But thanks to the infinite wisdom of the late, great Buck O'Neill, who said, this is where we will build this museum. This is the origin where this history's roots were anchored. And then by doing so, we will spawn redevelopment, a resurrection of a community that was once a very proud, prominent African-American community. 32 years later, we haven't looked back. People are living and yes. working and playing at 18th and Vine again. And we think we've just scratched the surface in oh. terms of what 18th and Vine can be. But we felt all along that we had a historical, a social, and a civic obligation to be a part of the revitalization yes. of this community. Yeah. And, and we made that decision, and it was the absolute best decision that we could have made. And uh, we're very proud of what we've helped kind of steer oh, the absolutely. direction of 18th and Vine, and will be uh, a leader in 18th and Vine's future. Absolutely. I mean, but look at it. You just said it. Now people are living, working, dining. Yeah partying yeah. and developing yeah. in our community. There's yeah. development coming Absolutely. up everywhere. So, you know, this is my, my stumping grounds. I'm a member of Centennial <laughs> United Methodist Church. You know what I'm saying? This plug. <laughs> Been there for, since uh, the 50s, 60s. However, um, when you talk about the anchoring of this community, had Buck said, okay, I just want to, you know, I want to get this out here and I want people to know about it. And yes, this will be a better place. Um, I don't think, I don't yeah. think this community would have survived without so. it. Uh, I don't think so either. I really yeah. don't. Yeah. You know, because I, 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 and I pondered this on many occasions. What would have happened if we had taken it somewhere else? Yeah. I just don't think that 18th and Vine would be the 18th and Vine that it is today. And I don't know if it would have the incredible future that is ahead of it. Yeah. And, and I can tell you now. That is a lot of responsibility for a museum to shoulder, but we were willing to shoulder that burden of trying to be the catalyst to spark development. Yeah. That's exactly what Negro Leagues Baseball did for so many urban communities across this country. Yeah. You see, Kim, wherever you had successful black baseball, you had thriving black economies. And, wow. and quite frankly, I'm not sure the African-American community realized what we were losing when we lost the Negro Leagues, because we lost that driver that sparked that economic development yeah. in so many of those urban communities. And of course, Jackie Robinson's breaking up the color mm -hmm. barrier, not only integrated Major League Baseball, but it spawned integration in our society in a greater capacity. And then all of a sudden, those segregated, mandated Black-owned businesses could no longer compete. Oh, yes. Yes, and that makes sense. Died. Yes. They died. Yes. And with yes. it, the death of many of these urban communities, yeah. 18th and Vine was no exception. To hear Buck and others talk about what 18th and Vine used to be like when they got here, 
when it was the epicenter of black oh, life. Yes, yes. Anybody who was anybody made their way to historic 18th yes. and Vine. And as he would say, if you had a relative, you come to Kansas City, you had a relative that lived here that you hadn't seen in a little while. Yeah. All you had to do was stand on the corner of 18th and Vine on a Saturday night. <laughs> they got to walk by there. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. You know, when I look at, because being a part of the community uh, through my church, as well as uh, just being a part of this community. I love, love this district, always have. And, um, you know, we have an organ in our in our church that the old jazz musicians would play all weekend, <laughs> all night Saturday, and go over to the foundation yes, and play, yes. and then walk across the parking lot, play the organ for the choir, and then go to sleep. <laughs> and so we have an organ that is historic, and it just reminds me of how much... Um, Blackness and how the roots are so deep here yeah. in this community. And then they hear, hear those stories. I, we talk about um, breaking the, the color line and the barrier, but also the Negro Baseball uh, League is very pivotal in opening it up for all minorities. Oh, there's no question. No question. Our game, Kim, is a global game today Yeah, because of the Negro Leagues. Now, they never got credited for it. It is eye opening for so many visitors when they come here and learn that the Negro Leagues took their brand of professional baseball into Canada. <laughs> they were oftentimes the first Americans to play in many wow. Spanish speaking countries. It was a touring team of Negro Leaguers that introduced this brand of professional baseball to the Japanese going all the way back to 1927. And so the Negro Leagues didn't care what color you were. All they cared was, can you play? Can you play? That's it. Yes. And, and, and really, that's the way it is supposed to yes. be. Yes. And that's why I tell people that the story of the Negro Leagues embodies the American spirit. Unlike any story in the annals of American history, it is everything that America prides herself in being. Yeah. But she's not there yet. Absolutely. No, she's not there yet. And because she's not there yeah. yet, that means yeah. that she's not the greatest country in the world. Right. It just means that there's still work left to be, to be done. done. Yeah. And it's our job. And it's the generation that will follow us, their job to continue to demand the most out of this country so that we continue to create equal opportunities for everyone who calls yes. this country home. And so what we hope that happens when our visitors walk away from this story, that they walk away embracing the true value of diversity, yeah. equity, inclusion, yeah. and how those are pillars toward building a bridge toward tolerance and respect. That's what we're trying to get as a uh, society. It is. Yeah. It is. Absolutely. It's just because I don't act like you, don't look like you, don't talk like you, don't worship in the same place that you do, then that makes me bad yeah. or it makes you bad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and we've got to get away from that. You know, we are all fundamentally the same. Yeah. But our differences, we shouldn't be running from. We should be embracing them. Oh, so, absolutely. yes, as you know, the great Martin de Higo yes, is, yes. is standing right behind you. He hailed from Cuba. His, wow. nickname, his nickname was El Maestro. El Maestro. The master. Because ah. he could do it all. Yeah. Played all nine positions. Played all nine of them well. Yeah. He is the only baseball player in the history of our sport to be enshrined into five different wow. countries' baseball halls of fame. Wow. Mexican, Cuban, Venezuelan, Dominican, and in the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. So we need Big Poppy to come and check Absolutely. it out. Because it's, the, it's their story. That, yeah. It's their story yeah. as well. This is a story about black and brown. Yes. Because the Hispanic or the Spanish-speaking player couldn't play in the major leagues either. Now, once upon a time, white Cubans could play. Don't yeah. know why just white Cubans, but if you were of any other ethnicity, you couldn't play. You couldn't play. So what yeah. did they do? They found sanctuary playing in the Negro Leagues. And so when we went to their countries, we were treated like heroes. Wow. So now we're staying in the finest hotels, eating in the finest restaurants that those countries had to offer. And then you come back home <laughs> and you're treated like a second class citizen. Yeah. Yeah. We had some work to do then. And we still have a little work to do now. We have a lot of work to do. We got do a lot now. of work to do. But That's okay. It, but it's okay because like you, uh, I am a proud American. I'm a proud yes. to say I'm an American. I'm unapologetically black, but I am a proud American. And I do think America is the greatest country ever. Uh, but again, when I look around here and I told you this today, when I walked in here, I am truly a patron of the <laughs> Negro, because I, I love museums, but I love history. Yes. And our history is so, so rich. It is. And uh, I come in here and it never fails 
I see something and I know it's been here and I've either skimmed over it or forgot yeah. that I saw it. So it's brand new to me. Even the stories, uh, when you tell the stories and I've been to stories, you've told the same story over again, but it's something about it that just, <laughs> that's why I said, Buck lives in you. It does because Kim, I used to hear him and I don't care if he had told a story a thousand times, if he was going to tell it to you, he was going to tell it as if it was the first time he ever told Absolutely. that story. So when I'm down here and I'm in group settings and I'm telling these stories, I don't want to cheat people. Right. I want to give it to them. <laughs> I want them to feel it. Yeah. I really do. I want them to feel it. I hope they embrace it. And, and what this history really, really, truly means. And and, and so, yeah, no, uh, I enjoy telling the stories. And many of these are stories that Buck shared with me. And I get to share them with others. But I do think by doing so, it feels like I keep him alive in my mind right. and in my heart. Yeah. And I don't want Buck to ever die. Yeah. I know physically he's not with us. Yeah. But spiritually he is. He is. He's he never left gonna, us. He's always going to be with us. Yeah. You walk into Bethel AME and you know <laughs> Buck is there. My, <laughs> Buck and my grandmother probably sitting somewhere in heaven <laughs> chatting it up. Uh, you know, so I want to pivot a little bit. Two years ago, two or three years ago, you did something. Uh, you made a decision uh, that really uh, opened up, um, even across the country, the revitalization, the hearing of the Negro Baseball Museum, uh, Baseball League, by uh, licensing the monarch name. Yes, two years ago. Yeah. Two years ago, we entered into an amazing partnership with Mark Brandmeier, who had bought the Kansas City T-Bones, the former Kansas City T-Bones. Yeah. Well, what happens? COVID hits. Yeah, and he had, yeah, he had a little time on his hand in 2020. And late in the year, he reached out to me with this idea to see what I would think about the possibility of rebranding the T-Bones as the Kansas City Monarchs. And initially, Kim, I wasn't feeling this idea, right. I'll be honest, because the Monarchs is our flagship brand. Right, right. There's so much prestige in and around the Monarchs. But Mark and I had a chance to sit down together. He shared his business plan, which was more than just a business plan relative to what the baseball team was going to do, but how this could be a part of an immersive experience around the history of the Negro Leagues. And the one thing that I've always preached here, and I think this is important for any museum, specifically any history museum, and particularly a cultural institution like this one, is that you have to establish relevancy. You have to. Yes. Yeah. Because our kids are so savvy today. Yes. They are quick to yes. say, oh, that was then, this is yeah. now, oh, that don't absolutely. apply to me. Yes. And I have to show them how the life lessons that stem from a story, Negro Leagues baseball hadn't been played in over six decades. Yeah. But the life lessons still absolutely apply to things that we see happening in our society today. And sitting down with Mark, we both came to the conclusion that this would be a great opportunity to extend the Monarchs brand to a new generation yes. of people who may not have ever heard of the Kansas City Monarchs. Yeah. We entered into that partnership. And as you know, in our very first year of the partnership, the Monarchs would win the American mm -hmm. Association Championship, got this close to getting back to the American Association Championship in year two. And it's been an amazing partnership and we're seeing more Monarchs gear uh, around the community than Absolutely. ever before. Absolutely. And it opens up the opportunity for us to reach a portion of Western Wyandotte County to get them down yes. to the museum. The museum is visible out there at Legends Park. And so it has been a tremendous partnership, but it doesn't just stop there. When they travel, they're taking the Kansas City Monarch name and brand That's on right. the road and is opening up other people's eyes I wanted to inquire and learn more about the history of the great Kansas City Monarchs who as they once said were the talk of the town all over the world yeah. and they're the talk of the town again hit it that way Absolutely. you know honestly and you know I am a monarch fan so yes, you know yes, I, yes. I, we make sure that we are there at as many games as we can uh, love, 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 uh, supporting the monarchs wearing. It is a proud, proud yeah. day yeah. to walk in, uh, 
in a jersey that says monarch. Monarch. You know, um, I have Buck O'Neill gear and <laughs> I was there for the retiring of Buck's number. I, I think that was probably one of the most, um, amazing feelings that I've had. I've only been to college. Uh, number retirement. Retirements, so yeah. to have, yeah. to me, the, the uh, Major League um, Negro Baseball me, uh, League was a national league. And th for me, this was Major League retirement. And I'm like, yeah, well, in, in, in many ways it was. And it just was part of what has been an extraordinary year for the Negro Leagues Baseball yeah. Museum and Buck's omnipresence yeah. still with us. Going back to going back to last December when we got the word that he was finally being yes. inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Yes. So, you know, at that time, 15 years after he missed by one vote, and to this year's actual induction in, into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, and the Monarchs retiring yeah. his number, the Chicago Cubs inducting him into their Hall, Hall of, of Fame, Fame yeah. where Buck spent so many years yeah. there as both a coach, uh, as a scout, and then eventually the first African-American coach right. in Major League Baseball history there with the Cubs. And that's why I say it's almost like he never left us. Yeah. Well, yeah. let me, let me because I want people to, to really get out of here because this is about to happen. Uh, it's not long. We have the uh, Negro, the, the, the U.S. Mint, Yes. Has. Yes. A set of commemorative coins. Come on. Yeah. Now, yeah. which we're extremely proud oh my of. God, yes. Because if you understand, excuse me, if okay. you understand how difficult it is to get these coins. Yes. They're highly competitive. We got Congress to authorize the U.S. Mint to create these coins in 2020. Yes. In the midst of a very contentious presidential election year, you've got to get three quarters of Congress to agree to do this. Wow. Now, as you well know. <laughs> to get the Dems and, and the Republicans, Republicans together. to agree on anything <laughs> is very, very challenging. Yeah, the sun is out. No, on exactly, a sunny day. exactly. Yeah. No less in the midst of a contentious presidential yeah. election year yeah. is short of a miracle, and we like to say that the spirit of the Negro Leagues bridged both sides of yeah. the aisle, and we were able to get the necessary votes to authorize Congress, well, for Congress to authorize the U.S. Mint to create what has become a series of three U.S. Mint yes. commemorative coins, yes. and in. The end of December, they go away. They go away. And I have mine, guys. Yes, I, yes. I bought mine the day that they were unveiled. And, and I uh, plan to hopefully buy one more set uh, because I want to leave them to my son exactly. and my daughter. I have, exactly. I have a son and a and, daughter. And whether and you I, are a coin collector yes, or not, this is so significant this. Yes. for the Negro Leagues for the first time ever to be represented yes. in this fashion. Yeah with a series that includes a gold, a silver, and a clad copper coin. Yes. You don't have to buy the full set. No, you can buy no. them individually, yeah. but they are beautiful coins, yeah. and it represents a tremendous tip of the cap yes. to what the history of the Negro Leagues represented both on and off the field. And if we're successful with selling as many of these coins as possible, surcharges will come back to support yes. the Negro Leagues Baseball yeah. Museum. And so that is an added bonus to what has been a stellar year for this museum. Yeah. yeah I, I, I want to let the households know, too, that they are affordable. They are I affordable. think every black household in America should have at least one coin. Yeah. And I, I mean, agree. That is, um, that's history. That is something that can be passed down from generation to generation. And it is an investment into us. Yes. You know, that's yes. one of the things that I talk a lot about is our failure to invest in our own communities. Well, it's important, Kim, that as African-Americans, we understand and hopefully embrace that culture and heritage are not free. Yes. So these institutions have to be supported. Yes. Because when our children walk into this environment, and for many of them, it is their first museum experience, which I'm very proud of. Yes. They get to see themselves. Yes. They get yes. to see themselves. Yes. When I was a kid, there were no we places for that. me to go yes. to a museum where I saw me. Yes. And, and so when our that. children yeah. walk in, they get a chance to see themselves. Yes. Now, this will prepare them to go to other museums. We're building new museum fans. Yes. But it's, it's really special that they get it to go into one where they see people who look just like them and they get to see them in their prominence. Yeah. Yeah. I've been to many civil rights 
social justice museums, they're all amazing, but you feel a little bit beaten down on some of them yes. because our experiences have been such a downtrodden kind of one when we look at that struggles towards civil rights and social justice. But here's a social justice civil rights museum where you come out and you feel triumph. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because I am giving you an entire different purview of the black experience. Absolutely. Because our journey in this society hadn't always been down track. No, it's all, there's success even there are in success our, stories. but this, I mean, yeah, and that, this, is, this is one of the, one of the stories I think I love the best because we talk about the successes. Yes. We don't, the, the, the problem with them being able to live or to play in the major leagues or to go in the towns and, and have to be, uh, isolated and sometimes ran out of town. Exactly. Uh, that's not the story. That's not the story. The story is how successful, how the monarchs, was it 40 championships? <laughs> I mean, God, whoever heard of that? But I mean, that the story of the success of the resiliency and of that's the people. Story. And that, that's the story. Yes. Yeah. Yes. As I tell people all the time, our story is not about the adversity. Yeah. But rather what they did to overcome the adversity. Yeah. And, and that's the story oh. that plays here. Now, yeah, we paint the picture of what segregation was like. Yes. We, we, which we know was a horrible chapter yeah. in this country's history. But out of segregation rose this wonderful story of triumph and conquest. And Kim is based on one small, simple principle. You won't let me play with you in the major leagues. Okay. I'll create a league of my a own. A league of my own. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm going to jump right to Buck O'Neill. Yes. You know, we talked a little bit about the commemorative coins and every household. You know, if you can't afford a coin, which uh, some of us can't, yeah. there is a campaign right now. That's right. A million bucks. Thanks One a million, million bucks. Thanks a million bucks. <laughs> One dollar. One dollar. One dollar. Every American in America could go could online do, and do a dollar and do one dollar yeah. and it is to support and to um to open get our get the the uh the new museum uh, opened. Buckle Mill Education and Research Center. Oh my God. And I'm waiting patiently, <laughs> not so patiently, <laughs> eagerly to uh be at that grand opening. Yeah. But um tell us a little bit about that and the gala coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, you know Every now and then I come up with these crazy <laughs> ideas uh, and, and this was one of them. But it was also, I think, very fitting way for us to say thank you to Buck yeah. for him teaching us about the heroes of the Negro Leagues, for him so, as I like to say, so beautifully demonstrating to all of us that you could get further in this life with love yeah. than you could with hate. Yeah. And so after he was inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. We came back in late July and we announced a campaign called Thanks a Million Buck. Uh huh. And it was our opportunity to do so. And what we've tried to do was challenge as many people as possible to consider donating at least one, one buck yeah. in memory of Buck O'Neill and to support the completion of the Buck O'Neill Education and Research Center at the site of the former Paseo YMCA, which is where the Negro Leagues were formed in 1920. Wow. And we are restoring that building. That building will become the Buckle Neal Education Research Center. And so if you are so inclined, please visit thanksamillionbuck.com and make a donation of at least one dollar or more. Or you can send your check to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in recognition of this campaign. Our goal, as you mentioned, is to try and raise a million dollars by getting at least a million people to contribute a dollar or more to this yeah. campaign. Whatever we generate, as my late mother would say, is more than what we had. <laughs> we started with zero. <laughs> we get $2, we get $2 more than we had, yes, yes. And it will go a long way to helping foster Buck's dream of an education and research center. Here was a man who dedicated himself to education, even though he was denied a formal education at his own Sarasota High School as a kid, yeah. because when they built that high school, it was for white kids only. And he never, never stopped preaching the value of an education as the way for people to pull themselves out of whatever their circumstances yeah. are. And, and he was a Renaissance man himself. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so this is, this campaign is a lot of fun. We'll culminate his Hall of Fame celebration 
with the Buck O'Neill Thanks a Million, well, with the Thanks a Million Buck Hall of Fame Gala that's being planned for Saturday, November the 12th here at the museum and at the Gym Theater. And, you know, we'll raise a little money, but more importantly, we'll have a lot of fun. I got celebrating my table. Buck uh, I got mine. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's going to give everybody a chance to dress up and yes, look pretty. look pretty. You know, like Buck would want. Yeah. And we've got some very special guests coming in to help yeah. celebrate Buck. We got a post-event concert with the original Lakeside. Oh, wow. As we celebrate Buck's fantastic voyage into the National Baseball Hall of Fame with the folks who gave us Fantastic voyage, the original Lakeside. Okay, so I, I'm a, you know we we talk a lot, and and this is this is um, something that you're very not comfortable with, but I, I can't let my show go on without talking about you. You have created this. You've taken what Buck handed you, and you've selflessly, and I and I can witness this. I'm not saying this just to to stroke your ego because you have none, but to say thank you, Juan, when you come up, you said, I come up with these hairbrained ideas, <laughs> the hot dog fest. Uh, I mean, you, we're talking about the gala. Uh, you do the harvest moon. These are things, these are historic things that you yeah. could do anywhere. And you continue to say, I'm going to stay right here in this community and I am going to continue to give back. Yeah. Um, you know, we were both, we come from a faith in which the more you give, the more you receive. Absolutely. And when you give with the open heart freely, God always returns it. Yeah. So, uh, we're about to close out. I mean, this was the best half an hour I've ever spent in my whole entire <laughs> life. And I know that we will do this again. Yeah, we'll I'm do looking this. forward to it. Um, I'm going to have you look into the camera and tell everybody exactly, you know, what's coming up. Uh, how they can, uh, if there's, if we haven't sold out yet, how they can uh, yeah. get their tickets or buy a table yeah. uh, for the gala and how important it is to the community. Yeah, absolutely, y'all. Uh, we hope that, number one, you'll go to usmint.gov and consider buying one of those beautiful Negro League commemorative coins. We also want you to come and join us for the Thanks a Million Bucks Hall of Fame Gala. You can get tickets online at nlbm.com or simply by calling the office at 816-221-1920 during our normal business hours. And if you can't do any of those things, bring your families here to experience the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. It is something that we are obviously proud of because we think we have the best history, baseball history museum anywhere in the world. And that's with no disrespect to my friends in Cooperstown, New York. But this place is really, really special. Yes. And it's a place that should be shared in a family setting as we continue to pass history down to the next generation so that they can learn, but more importantly, y'all be inspired by these incredibly courageous athletes who, yeah. as I like to say, forged a glorious history in the midst of an inglorious time in American history. So there are so many ways to support but you can learn more about the museum at nlbm.com. But I look forward to seeing you at the Thanks a Million Buck Hall of Fame That's Gala. Right. Ladies, get your gowns. Men, <laughs> get your tuxes or your suits and put them on and come on down and hang out with us on Saturday, November the 12th. Well, you know, this is going to end. And it, it, like all good things, they come to an end. <laughs> this I don't want to end, but I will say this. You heard it first here. Get your gowns, ladies. Get your tux, <laughs> gentlemen. But most of all, bring your families here. There is a spirit in this yes. museum that is uh, unbelievable. And when you walk in here, you know that it is a living, breathing history that you don't want to miss. You want to share this with your children. Please just remember that these doors are open for this community. They've stayed here for a reason. So let's invest in it. I want to thank Televita again. Number one, live streaming. Uh, this is the best television station that I can think of. <laughs> I'm telling you, these guys are great. I'm here. I'm in the Negro League Baseball Museum. <laughs> get down here. They have a great gift shop. You can get all your swag and your gear and your merch. Come on down. See Bob. Here comes the And you, get this story. Thanks again. You guys have a great day. Be kind to someone 
and be good to yourself. See you later. Bye.